two, three. My name is Sharon Bennett, and my new record, Are We There, is out this May, and I can't wait for you to hear it. These songs are about love. They're about being yourself. They're about communicating and being honest with yourself. Unpaid internship to rock and roll um, star, how, how does that work? It was a very, I've had a very strange path, for sure. Uh. After I moved back from Tennessee, I moved back with my parents around 23. Got a job at a wine store in Jersey. Through that, I learned a lot about wine. Got my first job in New York at Astro Wines. Worked there part-time and played open mics and started playing shows and stuff. And met up with an old friend from Tennessee who was the assistant to Ben Goldberg at Bada Bing Records. And I just, from doing my own music, I wanted to learn how a smaller label worked and I was only, you know, burning CDs off of my laptop from demos that I used on the internal mic and hand making the packaging and playing and it turned from being an intern at the label to part-time, but then he hired me full-time so I can get insurance and I became a publicist somehow. I was terrible at it. <laughs> and um, between balancing that and tour managing other bands and playing more shows myself, I spent more time on the road than in the office and I decided to take the plunge and do music full time. So every intern can follow that path, basically. So it starts <laughs> off at the wine store, ends up where you are now. <laughs> now, you have a new record out, Are We There, um, your fourth recording, and uh, there's sort of a theme it seems for a lot of these songs, um, work-life balance, career versus relationship. In doing this album, did you learn anything new about your own sort of work-life balance, career, relationship balance? I learned that I would not be who I am without music. And when I don't play, when I don't write, I don't feel good. And when I surround myself with people that are supportive, that I think I'm a better person to myself as well as my friends and family, and on some level, I know that my music is therapeutic for me more and more than I've ever realized. And I just continue to surround myself with good people and hope that wherever the path leads me, at least I'll always feel supported. Now, now speaking of therapy, there are some songs on, on this album that deal with a lot of sort of romantic pain, personal pain. And this one song pick that stands out to me, Your Love is Killing Me. <laughs> and I, I understand that your, your, your mom called you after she heard that, right? She's like, are you all right? Like, I thought you were doing OK. <laughs> I'm like, well, if I didn't have these songs, I wouldn't be OK. You know, that's just a part of me that I can compartmentalize, file it away. And then I'm no longer that feel like I don't have that feeling anymore. I can look at it and identify it and move on is like mindfulness, like a, you know, an act of mindfulness, I think. Do you think that past boyfriends can see themselves in your lyrics and go like, oh, that's me, I did that, <laughs> or I was responsible for that? I sure hope so, <laughs> you know, because I, I get, you know, I, I, I feel a little guilty about it being so personal and being about relationships, but at the same time, if somebody meets me, they kind of know what they're getting into, you know? <laughs> like, I don't hide what I do, and I'm pretty honest, and sometimes it's brutal, but, you know, I mean, it goes both ways, you know, there's pain on both ends. You know, I know that someone's out there hearing these songs and, you know, seeing my name and, and knowing that there's a lot of love, but there's a lot of pain, too. But I always thought a song was sort of a bad way to get back at a boyfriend because it would feel great to be in a song. I mean, no matter, you know, everyone wants to be the person that your soul vein is about. I mean, it's part of the whole theme of the song. So. Well, I'm not, but I'm not being, it's not a vengeful thing. Uh -huh. You know, I don't do it to get back at somebody. I do it to heal and I do it to learn and, and gain perspective myself and just get through it. I don't do it out of spite or anything. Now take me back to your, your teenage years. Uh, you were living in New Jersey th for, for your teenage years? Yeah, I lived in New Jersey up through high school. What kind of music would I found like on your CD player at, at a teenage Sharon Van Etten? What, 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 what would I have heard? Elastica, Nirvana, oh. Ani DeFranco, Liz Fair, so good stuff. Amos. Uh, Third Day huh? Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was that was a, a long time ago, and um, they might be giants. And 
Um, also, just like old school rock and roll and doo-wop, like Leslie Gore and Everly Brothers and Mamas and the Papas and stuff like that. Are there any artists you feel had a really real imprint on your music today that you still sort of feel their influence? Maybe even trying to escape it somehow. But is there any? Are there any artists in particular that sort of stand out to you as kind of your, your um, the, the ones that really guide you along your path? I think it started a lot with the Four Seasons and the Everly Brothers hmm. because I learned how to sing harmony to their music because most male-centered music I can't sing; it's not in my range. So I naturally <laughs> gravitated to the harmony. And ever since I was a kid, like I, I hear harmonies everywhere I go, like every any kind of song at all, and I'll hear them. But then also later in life, PJ Harvey just you know, made me rethink about music and how tough you can be and still be feminine at the same time, and you know without being like the stereotypical like girl that you see you saw in teen magazines growing up, you know. Now there's a line in uh, on one of the songs in this album that a lot of critics have been sort of. Uh, seizing upon about one hit wonders. Can, can you tell me that line? Oh, yeah. Uh, people call me a one hit wonder, but what happens when I have two? <laughs> Is that a fear that you have that your, your um, success will be <coughs> short lived and you'll only have a couple hits and then have to move into another, another profession or something? Is that a fear that you have, a real anxiety? No, I mean, it's funny because I think even though that's like a small part of that line, like the main part of that line is just about I'm a lightweight with weed. Hmm. And it's not really about my career. So it's more about we than your career. Okay, that's great. That reassures me. <laughs> Sorry. A lot of song lyrics turn out to be about weed. It turns out. <laughs> I mean, they're about other things. You know, I think they're about like you know philosophy or content. They're about weed. But it's also like a wink. It's also like a wink to my last record, which I felt like got a lot of attention because of the people I worked on it with, and it was. You know, I'm really proud of it, and I wouldn't take it back at all. And yeah, I feel like I got a lot of new fans from putting it out there. But at the end of the day, I still felt like the the cast of characters overshadowed my songwriting and the press, and made me want to do this one myself. And it's more of a wink to that too. But because your last album was produced by Aaron Dessner of the National, a great rock band, and yeah. in this one, you produced it yourself. Yeah. And what did you think of the, having that extra burden on top of the singing and the songwriting and the piano playing and all of that? It was really hard, but it was worth it. And I feel like it's the most me that I've ever been able to present on a record because I finally had the confidence to communicate with other musicians and not feel so insecure about my language and work with people that understood me in a way where it wasn't like constantly banging my head against the wall because I like go like this when I talk about vibe and I, you know, like I have to play a drum or show a lick to, to push people in the direction that I hope that they want to go in. But I was also a lot more carefree with the songs and let people be open to the ideas that they heard in their head too. There are some star connections here though because you use some instruments that were associated with some other sort of top <laughs> musicians like the, the, the <coughs> piano that John, um, John Lennon used for Imagine. That shows up on the record, right? Oh uh, yeah, the album Imagine. Um, Stuart Lerman, who worked on the record with me, we most of the time we were in his studio in New Jersey called Hobo Sound in Weehawken, but he, the piano that he had on site was an upright, and it was hard to isolate the vocal and the piano sounds to mix it well, but I'm all, I couldn't just track the piano and do a vocal over it on a second track so like, because it ended up feeling like it lost a lot of heart. Mm. So he made a call out to a couple of his friends that had studios that had a grand piano and one of the studios that called back was Electric Ladyland in the village and it was pretty, pretty special. That was the Patti Smith piano that they used on horses. I don't think she played on it. I like to imagine <laughs> she leaned on it and like, you know, maybe had a cigarette while working on that record. But it was way later in the process. We had done most of the tracking already but in that piano, the, on the Electric Ladyland piano, I, I, I re recorded those two songs on. And then later, we did most of the tracking when his, another friend called back and said, hey man, you still need a piano? Because I kind of got this thing going. And he had all like most of the gear from Record Plant. And he found out it was just downstairs. After all the flooding in Jersey, they were storing everything there. And they, 
which is not easy. They brought up this grand piano up two flights of stairs. So the guy calls you up and says, hey, man, I got a piano. It sounds like a top. It sounds like, you know. <laughs> you know, I know. You, well, they're friends. They work together. To, okay. Below the studio, it's a sound stage. So bands like the Rolling Stones and Lady Gaga will set up a full lighting rig and a full stage and sound set up to, like, work their, their stadium setups just for practice so, like, their whole crew can work. But they also have a storage facility for studios and stuff, and they borrow gear all the time. Now, I'm interested in your creative process for your songwriting. When you come up with a song, does it sort of occur in the middle of the night? Are you in the studio working it out, you know, on your guitar late at night? When do most of your ideas for your work come to you? It's really unpredictable. I, you know, usually I like working at night just because I've had a few drinks and I, my, I let my guard down even if it's just for myself. and. I can hit record and write and sing stream of conscious and not be overly self-aware of what I'm doing and I'll put that down for a few days and I won't listen to it right away because that's when you're your harshest judge is immediately and I give myself a few days to listen back to it and try to hear what it was I was going through at the time and and have a little bit more perspective from it. Well great, you know, Shan Van Etten, thanks a lot for coming to the Wall Street Journal Cafe and I appreciate it. The um, album is are, you, are, are we there? Thank you so much for having Thanks. me. Thanks.